tak dobre, tak ja začnem najprv po slovensky. Dnes sme vlastne vo finále našich, našich tohoročných stretnutí v rámci reflexí architektúry, ktoré veľkori sa podporil fond na podporu umenia z verejných zdrojov a teším sa, že, že sme tu takto mohli celý, celý semester byť. Dnes máme hostku svetového rozmeru, dá sa povedať, špeľa videčník z kancelárie Office Architekti, naozaj Patrik Architektka, ktorá mi len realizovala svoje projekty už asi po celom svete, ale súčasne učí na Harvardie a, a učí na, na Architecture Association v Londýne. Takže myslím, že už väčšie a lepšie referencie ani, ani nemožno, nemožno mať. Uh, dúfam, že si tú dnešnú prezentáciu teda užijete. Špela uh, Videčník is uh, here with us today in an evening and I mean this is a kind of, of really spectacular final uh, lecture in our, our this year series. I'm very happy that you um, accepted our, our invitation. Uh, And uh, okay, uh, Spela is already <laughs> already uh, starting the presentation, so I will stop for now and uh, I give the word to to her. Spela, you are welcome and please uh, take the floor. Yes, thank you, thank you for uh, for your invitation. Uh, I'm very sorry I could not join in person. Uh, Uh, I was in Bratislava, I think two years ago, just around this time, around just before Christmas, and I know how nice the city is. <laughs> so I hope you get a little bit of that uh, uh, that spirit also now in this very strange uh, COVID uh, time. Um, so, but hopefully maybe we will have another occasion to meet. Um, I will try my best to present uh, as live as possible uh, via Zoom. Um, So I will just start uh, as maybe some of you were in Slovenia yet, maybe not, uh, but if you were not, I would highly recommend to visit our small country. I just wanted to show you the size in comparison also to your country uh, because it's a very small, uh, small country. It's actually uh, less than an hour to come to the borders to Austria or to Italy and also less than an hour to come to to very high Alps uh, and uh, the coast. So we have a very, very diverse uh, region uh, and also very diverse uh, culture, meaning all architecture, food, dance, languages and so on and so on. So even if the country is so small, uh, there is uh, quite a big diversity and also influence on culture from the Balkan, from the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, uh, from, from Italy, from Venetian uh, uh, time, uh, Roman time, etc., etc. So we were really uh, always in a kind of middle between all these influences. And I think uh, you can taste them in our culture, architecture, food, uh, etc. Uh, so our office, uh, it's, it's not big. We are around 10 people normally, depends on how much work we have. This is a kind of, uh, I would say, normal size uh, uh, for a Slovenian uh, architectural office. But for example, if I compare it to offices elsewhere, for example, big offices, international ones, in the States or, or somewhere uh, similar, uh, what is different from our uh, part Maybe I can say that this is difference also uh, the difference between Central European uh, architectural offices and other offices is that even if we are small, we are uh, dealing with quite large scale projects and uh, very, very diverse projects. So we did, you know, hospital, we did uh, cultural buildings, historical buildings, uh, football places, uh, uh, museums, uh, single family houses, very, very small pro projects and so on and so on. So this is really what keeps us interesting uh, somehow in architecture, the, the diversity of work we are dealing with uh, for the last um, 20 years. Um, uh, also, what maybe makes us different from everyone else is that uh, our country got independent just when uh, Uh, Ruk Oman, my, my partner and myself, entered the Faculty for Architecture in Ljubljana. And um, the generation we are, 
part of in Slovenia is, is kind of influenced by this uh, change, uh, this rapid change that happened at that moment. Uh, the moment of independence also brought uh, different market possibilities. It brought kind of uh, uh, bigger um, uh, kind of uh, investment possibilities and so on and so on. And also many competitions uh, that we could take part uh, for public buildings that did not exist before. Slovenia was always a small part of, of Yugoslavia where all the big decisions, all the majority of government buildings were in Belgrade or in Zagreb. Uh, so after we got independent, there had to be rebuilt also this kind of public uh, buildings and uh, infrastructure. Uh, then what makes us also, uh, you know, like what, what kind of made our character as we are is also this kind of change of, of, um, of uh, economy. There were ups and downs uh, through our career. So we started, uh, you know, down and then it went to up. And then in 2009, it went down very much and now it's rising again. But probably because of COVID, we will go down again. <laughs> so this kind of rapid changes also uh, influence our work, the way the way we can, uh, the, the way the projects uh, we are dealing with, et cetera, and uh, et cetera. So as I mentioned, uh, the start was public buildings because uh, as, as a young architect, architect, of course, uh, you cannot just get commissions based on your uh, work. Um, so we entered many, many competitions at that time. And uh, we were very lucky for some reason to uh, win several of those competitions. And some of them later were built. As, as you will see in your future, there are competitions you win and then nothing gets built or it gets built differently or they even choose a different architect <laughs> so many things can happen but uh, in these first three projects major projects that we did uh, back then uh, we were quite lucky that we got commission at some point after when the client raised all the money and we were able to build it so this was our first project it's an extension of the city museum in Ljubljana uh, a very, very difficult project because uh, it's dealing with an old historical palace and with a lot of uh, uh, ruins history that is uh, hidden behind this palace and inside this palace. So structurally, from terms of heritage and so on and so on, there were many things to discuss. Um, so basically, this was what how the building was before and there was nothing in the courtyard. And they knew that they will probably find something below the courtyard. They didn't know what, but the extension had to be done. And also we arranged that whatever we will find, we will evaluate with the, with the archaeologist and decide what will be kept in situ and what we are not going to show. So this is the museum as it was at the end. Um, so the, the, during the construction, we basically we had to adjust all the plans, which were structurally quite complicated because the columns, we had to move in the areas uh, where uh, things were not damaged in the history like for example this is a piece of roman road that went here through and this is area where the roman world road in the middle ages was already destroyed so we could put a column here then this is the the cafe sits on the original floor from the baroque palace that stood before and so on and so on and the floor itself uh here below it's actually the level of the city um during the prehistoric era and in this area also they found some prehistoric graves so as you can see all the cities are layered uh so the minus one meter 40 more or less is the the uh, this part which is the the medieval city and then about uh, two meters there is a roman city and about three and a half meters below there is a prehistorical city so all these layers are now exposed for the visitor to see uh, and also uh, the the roof the shape everything from 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 the this architecture arises from functionality of this space that people can step on the original floor as it was so these are the images also from the behind uh, 
then we deal quite a lot. I mean, we did quite a, a lot of projects that are also touching the history. This is uh, a project that was opened uh, last year. It's a, it's a school for music and dance, also in the historical city of Ljubljana, just basically a few steps away from this, our first project. Uh, it's a building that had to be structurally, strongly reinforced because of the earthquakes. And also they wanted to have some improvements such as uh, a concert hall, uh, refurbishment of a ballet room, uh, uh, rooms for, for music and so on and so on. So this is a kind of um, a building that we had to reinforce in concrete. So the, the, the building is it's quite beautiful. This is the Plechnik uh, library of Josef Plechnik next to our building. And this is also a kind of promenade, a little park that Plechnik did in the history. So he also did uh, an entrance to our building, but the building, uh, the intervention itself also happens here uh, in the courtyard. So this is a kind of uh, ex, uh, I would say flat roof that we um, transformed into a kind of on one side opened auditorium for music. And the point is basically structural reinforcement of the building uh, itself. The new stair for fire escapes. And the new acoustic hall, it's um, maybe seems simple, but it's a very, very complicated project. The acoustic, actually each of these plates is rotated slightly uh, according to certain degree. Some of the plates have perforations that also are rotated in, in some kind of degree, all to get the best sound uh, performance. Some of them reflect, some of them uh, absorb. So that's the final uh, image and the details of the ballet room, the new uh, stairs and the fire stairs that we arranged in the area and the view from the castle. Uh, another building uh, that was uh, done uh, not not long time ago it's a very small chapel a farewell chapel is one of my favorite projects uh, we did uh, basically the, the the proposal from this little community was to make a kind of farewell uh, space for a family who says goodbye to to, to the, the person who passed away in slovenia there is this procedure then people come gather here outside they say goodbye and then they make a kind of symbolic walk all around where they come to this last place in the graveyard uh, but actually this building also is retaining walls for the hill for the soil that comes from the behind also uh, hides the garbage also contains all the toilet spaces storage services uh, etc etc so in a way it's a it's a flat roof uh, that uh, that basically uh, holds inside all these different uh, programs. This is the view of, it's a simple project, uh, just reinforced uh, walls made of uh, concrete and uh, the inside, the heart of the, of the chapel is uh, a simple wooden space with glass. This project, maybe if you saw some works of, of our Slovenian colleagues, maybe someone presented you this project already, um, because it's a, it's a nice project that we shared between us. Uh, could you tell me if you got it presented by someone uh, before, so that uh, I... We've, we've been discussing about it uh, with, with, um, with Lazi Glaza, but uh, he was not presenting the project. Okay, so it. then I will present please, it please our present name. It, yes. Yeah, yeah, because in a way it, it has a kind of common language with this walk, uh, as I explained in the last project, and also, uh, you know, with the, with the idea of this museum. Mm. It's a small community space. Um, there was this, we call it Zadružni Dom. I don't know if you have a similar expression in your language. Uh, it was an old uh, building, more or less looking like that, really nothing <laughs> special, that was done after the Second World War, which each, each town had a kind of building where they gathered for some kind of manifestation, political, you know, gatherings, but also some small performances of the villagers, of the school kids, um, so and so on and so on. So it was a kind of community center that people had at that time instead of um, 
visiting the church, they were visiting this kind of uh, buildings. Uh, and the old community center, they asked to demolish and to do a new community hall instead of that center. And on top of it, create a museum dev devoted to a special guy. Hermann Nordung, who was the first one who uh, did uh, theory about space. So Hermann Nordung uh, drew, made a book that actually at the end uh, was influence, influencing the movie such as Odyssey by Kurbik and also in a way it was influencing the, 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 the you know, space, uh, space program of NASA and of the Russians. Um, and actually he was dealing in how to deal with the gravity. So he made this, he called it space wheel uh, kind of object. And of course, this space wheel was also inspiration for our building. So our building has this um, rounded uh, structure that uh, goes around the main hall, main, main uh, public hall and goes all the way up and somehow stands uh, without columns. Columns are very thin elements hidden behind these frames uh, so that in a way it creates a feeling of uh, just landing somewhere from space and when you are inside and you are walking around it creates a kind of uh, sense of gravity so in a way you know you are a little bit lose the gravity when you walk and uh, see these spaces. So in the uh, ground floor, there are uh, community spaces for the villagers. And in this uh, ring around the, the building, there is a museum. Uh, so here you can see the museum on top and the little community center in the middle. And this is the ramp with the exhibition spaces. The fire is there. And on very top, there are three offices for people to uh, read about uh, Hermann Nordnung's work that open up to the sky and to the stars. So you can also go up to the, to the upper, to the roof, and then you can come all the way down through this second fire stair, which is hidden in the uh, facade. So it was maybe someone explained you before, Vasa or, or some other colleague, that this was a kind of invited competitions where uh, we were invited, uh, the four offices, uh, Sadar Vuga and Biuk Perovic and the Grigorić de Kleva and us. And it was such an interesting project in a way, and there was no money at the start. Basically, they started the project without any money and they said, okay, if they will get a construction permit on time, they can get funding from the government and from the European community. So in a way, it was a kind of volunteer project. Uh, and then we said, okay, it's a, such a interesting program. Why don't we at some point just do the project together instead of competing? Uh, and I must say that it was uh, fun to collaborate. Uh, we divided the work. Uh, some of us worked more on, on idea concept and on, on, on construction permit drawings. Some worked more on the details and uh, uh, visiting of the construction site. So, so this was the result, which was quite nice. Uh, so this is a first football stadium we built in Maribor. It was also one of our first project a competition we won a long time ago. It's an extension of this old um, a concrete uh, tribune uh, that was uh, built uh, just after the war. Uh, and it's in a way kind of a monument to, to, to engineering of uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, and we had to do extension all around. And actually just now we are rebuilding also the, the, the building itself, refurbishing, meaning that the roof stays. So it's a very long project that is already with us almost I think 18 years, <laughs> so I think we will start with this project and maybe finish with this project our career. Um, so yeah, whatever. So <laughs> it never stops. Uh, of course, the reason is money. Uh, the government never really raised, managed to raise all the money to refurbish the whole stadium. But uh, it's a it's a really special site in the middle of the city. Normally, stadiums in other cities they are quite dislocated in periphery, but this one really lives with the city. Um, so in a way, it's a it's a very nice uh, 
place. And of course, since it's almost our first project, we have a kind of nostalgic uh, feeling towards it. So anyway, this was the this is the project that was done now uh, 12 years ago, I think. Uh, and it's a kind of ring that goes around the, the main uh, football field and also hides under this plaza that is raised above. You go on this plaza, of course, if you buy the ticket, if you don't buy the ticket, you sit here on this grass. Uh, but otherwise, under this plaza, there are uh, gyms for local kids uh, from the schools and some kind of other sports such as karate or, or, or box and so on and so on. Uh, so this is the, the view of the finished area. And then, as, as I say, this part we are just refurbishing now. We are keeping the roof, but all the inside we are reconstructing uh, new. Um, so because of this project, which was in a way quite low budget, and as I explained, we really were building it uh, piece by piece. Uh, but in a way, people who who attended uh, the the uh, the events here, they liked the project very much because it has, they say, it has a very good acoustic. The, the Our football players said that for a long time they didn't lose any match here because uh, somehow the acoustic is so great that even if there are only few people watching that they can hear uh, the audience and also we made these colorful seats. The colors are from the from the local local team. I mean, the color combination, it's quite, uh, I must say, difficult. <laughs> so it's this uh, yellow and violet. And um, of course, we didn't want to write here, you know, Maribor uh, football club with violet and uh, yellow color, which first of all was the idea of the club. But in a way, we kind of tried to play with these colors uh, um, mixing it with gray uh, and they say oh yes these seats look like they are always full of people even if they are not so, <laughs> so basically um, also this belarus uh, uh, team played in our uh, football field uh, and they liked it so much that they came to us at some point and they asked can we buy uh, your project and rebuild it in belorussia in, in boriso and then first we thought when we read that email that there, you know, it's like a joke. We get many kind of emails, strange emails by different clients, um, which are not very serious. But then they rewrote, they called and so on and so on. And then we saw that actually they are serious uh, people and they wanted to have this uh, football um, uh, uh, stadium also in that in their city and we said well you know what your country uh, deserves uh, a football stadium which is just special for you not not a copy not buying a copy and reconstructing so we made an agreement that we made um, uh, a project uh, idea concept and after it was confirmed by the government the first photos i was showing you is uh, of course uh, the local president who has to say to everything and the government uh, when they came you know to 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 say yes to the project and so on and so on um, they placed it here in this area so it's a beautiful pine uh, wood uh, and there was an old army training center in this area. So some of these pines were already demolished. So as you can see here, uh, we made parking facilities inside the pockets where the pine trees were already demolished and the plaza goes around uh, the stadium. So I will now jump and I will go to the video. So we are not at the end too long because I think you can see all the images there and I will be explaining you the project through this video. I'm sorry you don't hear the sound, but uh, yeah, it was too complicated to combine. So as you can see, these are uh, these nice pine trees that were on the side before and we really didn't want to demolish them. So all the roads, all the infrastructure and of course around the stadium, the infrastructure uh, is quite uh, extent. Um, too big, if you ask me. Uh, we made all this in these pockets uh, where there were no trees present. Uh, the stadium itself, it's also shaped as arena. So it has this shell around the, uh, the internal football field and the seats gathered uh, around and under the seats also some public program. They have a restaurant, they have a bowling uh, club. They have some shops, uh, offices of this local team and so on and so on. Uh, 
uh, and then the shell around it we wanted to make it really in one material so that the roof and the facade that everything comes uh, from one material so what we chose uh, because it's a membrane is this uh, shingle uh, shape so basically it's this trapezoid shape um, that is curved in all directions so that it uh, provides no rain uh, inside uh, what we didn't know and we noticed at the end was that um, in Belarus there is a kind of local law that uh, all the works and all the materials need to be local if they want to be important from abroad it really really needs to be a very huge political reason so there was no one who local who knew how to build this um, but luckily you know there were calls from the client to change the facade to maybe just make it out of black hydro isolation and you know kind of <laughs> kind of uh, shocking ideas like that uh, but at the end uh, thankfully the render we did at the start was really really liked by um, uh, the government the people high in the government and they wanted to have exactly building like in the render so what we managed to do later was that we found a contractor a possible contractor a german small company from germany who does refurbishment of the baroque uh, churches and of these uh, onion shaped uh, shaped uh, roofs in in germany and they liked the building so much that they sent the two people to make uh, agreement with the local company they uh, sold them know-how and they were supervising the works uh, and uh, so basically at the end everything was uh, constructed by by the locals what you can see from this video and what we like is that as you can see in a way the area became a new public space also for the local people uh, they like to come here uh, you know have all sorts of events uh, photo shooting and so on and so on uh, so in a way in this city body so really whenever we came there there was basically nothing to do not even a proper cafe or a square where people can gather and what is nice uh, is that in a way we managed to create also something nice like that for the community okay um a large scale building we uh made uh what was that two years ago uh three years ago almost now in slovenia is a hotel intercontinental uh it's a project it's, it's one of our of course first uh uh, uh high high rise uh, buildings uh, and also one of the first project when uh, big clients actually came from abroad so for for us this is new but it's it's becoming i think in bratislava as, as i visited it several times uh, in the near past uh, you have these foreign architects and foreign big money whatever either from local investment who have a partnership or something in slovenia so far this was not yet the case so that's why also i think that in a way the 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 architecture we have is not so generic as you can find somewhere else um but it's coming in a way unfortunately for us because of course people coming from abroad they have different different um you know different sympathies for the city for the culture of course you can get, get great architects who bring something new uh, but then also you have some of them who just take work commercially uh, so this was our first project dealing really with clients coming from abroad and i must say it was not an easy task because intercontinental is a chain where everything is very very much prescribed so uh, all the all the briefs how something needs to be by whom it needs to be approved and everything else really smells on a big um, generic uh, architecture as it is made elsewhere so uh, we really tried our best to do something based on their brief but then on the other hand uh, also local to the to the city itself and to our culture so one of these uh, is also the ornaments that you can see in the windows this kind of prints that um, come from the from the local uh, heritage but then also the shape of the building and everything that has a kind of dialogue uh, with the city uh, so now i will jump to a different uh, projects we did a lot of housing mainly social housing at the beginning of our career uh, 
and really all of them in a way had a similar brief mainly we called them napolitanka like like this because mainly all of them had to be uh, a cube uh, urbanism was predetermined as you know also in bratislava you have a very uh, strict uh, urban urban rules uh, and to change urban rules it's something that takes long time uh, for the client and normally they don't uh, change them because the time is money so so it doesn't work so basically all the projects we dealt with with the uh, uh, was about uh, this uh, uh, kind of blocks that had normally between five and six floors certain length to it and so on and so on and very similar program of uh, how many one room apartment two room three room and so on and so on so all what we could play with basically all was the same <laughs> every client demanded the same every urban urban plan was more or less very very similar uh, so what we could find as our creative uh, approach was this um, belt between the inside of the apartments and the outside facade so we were normally adding to the buildings uh, areas where you have lojas balconies uh, winter gardens and so on and so on and this is where we kind of expressed also kind of architectural language even if the budget was very very low so this is our first building also we we built this uh, still as students and then this is, for example, a competition we won in 2003, two social blocks in Isola by the sea, where the balconies we got uh, influenced by the local uh, culture of people, how they change, how they, uh, how they um, live on their balconies. Of course, balcony for uh, someone living in Mediterranean is a very, very important uh, piece of space of their apartment. Uh, and normally they put outside all this furniture, um, you know, whatever, TV stuff and uh, air conditioning. They put kind of shading, uh, close the fences with all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, looking elements and so on and so on and of course also Mediterranean normally it's about uh, colors uh, so we said okay why don't we create a balcony that uh, has all these uh, elements already inside so it has a wardrobe where you can hide the air conditioning it has uh, um, outside um, uh, shading it has a, a fence that you can basically uh, enclose it and then you can be in a way hidden between these two side elements uh, so you can sit outside in your bathing suit and uh, no one no one can see you so this is the look of the building from the outside uh, this kind of play of the of the balconies and from the other side kind of colors in a way talk to the local colors and quite low cost building. So the other one I will jump is, uh, is also a low cost building here in Ljubljana, very, very long blocks, again, predetermined, uh, predetermined urbanism, where the only thing we could play with was again, these balconies. What I like about this, um, building in a way is that still now people sometimes call us and say oh can i change my balcony in a glass house or can i enclose a piece of uh, something because i want to do a room inside etc etc as you know uh, you know families change they grow they shrink uh, people move out new people come in and many people have different ways of living so in a way this facade is so diverse that even if they change something and of course they ask us so we we determine the raster the colors everything the building itself the architecture doesn't really um, change so this is a kind of flexible solution uh, this is the first large project we won abroad in a competition uh, like at the beginning uh, we did many competition also through our career um, and this was one of the first one big ones we did abroad uh, and somehow we were so lucky uh, to win it at that point it's a uh, it's a uh, student housing uh, in Paris uh, next to Parc La Villette this is Parc La Villette and the new opera house uh, if you if you were there at some point so our site is very very narrow site just here uh, and here the city was doing the a railway that a tram station so this was a last circle of the tram so what was good about that was that we really had to be very fast 
especially the contractor, the construction site had to be very fast because normally in France, people take it easy and they <laughs> prolong projects and uh, construction and so on and so on. So in a way, in our uh, case, it was different. So this is a very long, narrow site where we uh, managed to create two blocks with some gardens in between, uh, 186 apartments for the students, all of them the same. Uh, but again, having two faces, one looking uh, to the to the this part of the city and the other one looking to a football field that is behind uh, the building. So this is the view of the building towards the football field, of course, a kind of net that uh, provides also from the football ball. And then the loggia, each student apartment has a little loggia so people can sit here, be intimate, study, concentrate. Where here on this balcony, which is also entered to your room, you can have beer together with your neighbor, watch the football or just a beautiful sunset of Paris. From this side, there is a very really nice view of Eiffel Tower and the, the sunsets in Paris that are very, very long. <laughs> so basically, this is the view from the beginning. I will now again jump and the views of the rooms. I will now again jump to the video and I will explain you a little bit about this project through the video uh, as we won the competition it was a surprise for us so we were not even ready to build uh, the contract was signed in november and in march we were already supposed to receive a construction permit and everything really moved so fast that we couldn't even bother to find a local office who would uh, work with us so what we did at that time because everything was moving so fast uh, we uh, we had the local structural engineer and the local mechanical electrician and so on. So all these subcontractors were local, but architecture we at the end really just uh, uh, made from Slovenia. We had a guy who who used to work with us as a student, a French guy, uh, who who we employed later, opened the company in Paris, and then. Uh, got also the license there. Uh, so we, as part of European community, if you have a kind of portfolio of works, you can sign projects anywhere else. Uh, so this is a good part of being in the European community. Uh, so basically I'm quite proud of the fact that we managed to do it all, all from here. We said, okay, at any time later, if things will get complicated, maybe we will have time to find someone whom you can trust, but otherwise we will just uh, do it uh, uh, from here. Uh, and it worked. Um, in France, uh, the rules are very strict. You have very high insurance, very expensive one, but also the honorarium is much, much higher than in Slovenia and probably in Slovakia. Uh, but then the responsibility of an architect is quite large. You are also responsible to, to uh, to observe how the construction site is organized, the schedule of the construction site, but also you have to sign all the invoices of the contractors, which sometimes is good because uh, if they do, don't do what you want, you just simply don't sign their, their invoice. So, so, you know, it has, of course, good sides, bad sides. There was a lot of drama on construction site because of the mentality of French who always have a lot of drama about every <laughs> little thing but uh, otherwise I must say the relation with the client also with the people on the construction etc was very very positive uh, so the building had to receive a green uh, certificate uh, that's why the balconies are open so they always have natural light natural ventilation uh, all the bathrooms, as you can see here, there are some openings in this facade, have also natural light, natural ventilation. There is a recuperation inside. We have photovoltaics on the roof and quite a lot of isolation for Paris that actually is not a very uh, cold city. Uh, so yes, we did at the end this green certificate because if we wouldn't get it, um, the government, uh, the, the client would need to pay much higher tax to the city. So it's a good uh, policy from the city that if people don't do sustainable architecture, uh, they must pay a higher tax. So um, I think that's a quite a good uh, politics. Otherwise, the building is, is quite simple. As I explained, every student has its own intimate space on one side and this kind of common shared balconies from the other side. The green gardens, now these trees are quite big. Um, they are between, so everything in a way serves the students to be good in school.
and socialize, of course. As you can see, the bricks around the buildings around are mainly in bricks, some of them historical, some of them new. So also our facade that is much more economic than brick has this copper color that in a way creates dialogue with all this uh, surrounding. OK, so in a way uh, now, I will talk about our work uh, during the crisis. Uh, the crisis in Slovenia was really, really uh, quite large. Uh, a big surprise because we really had so much work uh, for a, an office like us, a small office with young people. Uh, you know, we had mainly three big, big, big projects built per year, which is quite a good amount of work. Uh, we were busy ever since we, uh, finish the school with all these kind of construction works and then suddenly there was almost no work collapse complete collapse uh, of the market um, so in a way uh, of course we didn't collapse because we had you know a lot of work from before so there was no kind of let's say economic problem uh, although a lot of clients uh, got to bankruptcy you know you, we had of course like everyone has problems of people owning us money and so on and so on but this part we kind of survived well but then more the question was, you know, we were young, we had a lot of energy, a lot of creative uh, uh, inspirations, uh, but no work. So we ask ourselves, so what can we do now? Uh, you know, in a way, it's such a pity that now you have to wait for so many years to get work again. Uh, and we, in a way, start, started our own uh, uh studies in a way our own um, personal interests and so on and so on so uh, at that time also we started to teach abroad since we had a little bit more time we then said yes to all these um, all these uh, um, uh, kind of asking us from different schools could you come and teach with us for a semester and so on which before we didn't have time so basically we started to teach at Harvard at that time uh, and also made a lot of lectures and workshops in some other schools of architecture uh, and mainly going to America made us questions you know where we are where we come from what is our heritage you know America is a big country without really a lot of uh, people coming from everywhere but architecture being so generic like for example a house in Alaska is the same like a house in in Florida and so on and so on so we tried to study what can make us different from from anywhere anyone else and then we studied all this uh, uh, local Alpine architecture uh, one of these projects was also for example refurbishment of this small uh, small uh, uh, barn in in uh in the suburbs where actually all the elements were uh, done from local elements such as for example this bathroom or the exterior where actually the building itself uh, stayed exactly uh, as it was from the outside but the inside there was a kind of new new way of using of course in this uh, slovenia i think is the only country that has these old uh, structures they are were used uh, to dry hay they are called hyrax uh, as i showed you before in some images and many of these structures right now these are these structures are being demolished because people just don't know why to use them again so in a way uh, since this is really our heritage uh, we tried to uh, show and studies what can be done with those buildings not to demolish them but in a way integrate a new uh, uh you know new new living housing or or whatever inside so this is one of these uh, approaches as you can see outside exactly as it was but inside a new wooden shell made just of spruce uh, quite simple economic uh, solution uh, isolation and a, a new kind of uh, living uh, inside. All materials are from the same material. Uh, all the elements, all the furniture, the floor, the ceiling, the walls, everything is done from the same spruce, local spruce.
it was quite published also in local newspapers, these projects, and we got many calls. I mean, normally, unfortunately, people who own these buildings don't really have money or culture to hire an architect, but whoever calls us, uh, you know, to get inspired by, by this project, we try to share with him, you know, plans and, and details. Uh, we publish them and so on, so hopefully we manage to help uh, and uh, many of these structures can be kept. Um, these elements we also used in our other projects, for example, these uh, new build projects. This is also a social housing that we did and it has the facade made this combination of, the, uh, of these hierarchy elements that create also intimacy between the, the uh, people inside and the outside. The roof here, maybe it's interesting to mention, is not really a pitched roof, it's actually a flat roof hidden behind because inside we hide all the air conditioning, chimneys, uh, all kind of installation that normally people would uh, either put on the balconies or outside. So it's all here. Then this is also a small building uh, in Kranska Gora, also a kind of town in the in the Alps. Uh, apartments and below a little pharmacy shop, again made of local materials. So this kind of um, uh, slate uh, on the facade and on the roof, uh, a wood, a stone, and then on top again installations that are hidden in this uh, pitched roof uh, structure so that it's not exposed on the facade or elsewhere. Or this shopping mall where the client was a construction company and they were offered to uh, demolish the old shop that was here to create a new shopping mall free of charge for, the, for this chain. But on top of it, they were able to do apartments that they could sell. So this was then the profit. So. I think it's quite a nice uh, combination because normally these shopping roofs are, you know, just flat abandoned roofs. Uh, and in this way, we could create a kind of shop, uh, a mall, not like a box, but really combining all these wooden materials and creating uh, homes or vacation homes uh, for people above. So again, this is a play of different uh, facade elements, different uh, gradient of uh, transparency and wood and then here on top the roof again uh, almost pitched roof but again on top these installations that I mentioned before so that we managed to um, to hide them all in this uh, in this time of of, uh, of uh, no work we also started these small researches of small units living units because um, we always liked to build, uh, so we are uh, not really theoricians. We like to try stuff as, as build. So we were asking ourselves, what can we build um, without a client ourselves? Uh, so we started with this research of a small units, such as, for example, this living unit which was attempt, uh, it was drawn first for the city uh, of Ljubljana as a kind of trial how to create little homes for immigrants. At that time, immigration problem was very, very huge in Europe. But before we finished this project, <laughs> it was already solved by, by the Turks somehow. Um, so basically there was no need for uh, this kind of uh, units again in the city, but still our research was done. It was done as a research how you can create that in wood and with some, again, elements of Slovenian uh, tradition. Uh, and uh, these were kind of trying to, of course, you can put it vertically, you can put it horizontally, you can do for two people, four people, six people, family, non-family and so on and so on. So it was all these kind of different uh, flexibility possibilities. And for one, we then really got money to build it. And we, at the end, uh, exhibited it uh, uh, first in Italy, in uh, Milano, um, in this uh, Ferro di Mobile in April uh, as an example of self-contained wooden unit that you can use for different purposes and also disassemble and assemble very, very quickly. 
uh, a size of each unit is so small that you can put it uh, on on your own car and uh, you know just pull it like a, a kind of caravan with you anywhere you want to go but then on the other hand you can also create larger aggregations uh, such as it was initially meant for the for the immigrants um, after that this house really had many many functions then it was uh, brought to Ljubljana where it was exhibited as a kind of small library of plechnik works in summer in the castle so people uh, so it was full of books and people could rent it and uh, sit here outside in the grass and enjoy the view uh, I can show it maybe from here a little bit uh, again assembled very very quickly so it was really maybe an hour and a half to assemble the whole uh, building uh, together all the elements are wood uh, we added also this little element on the facade it's ropes that kind of uh, play with the wind but otherwise quite minimalistic uh, details of windows etc inside in the ground floor there is a kind of could be living area but also has a possibility for for um pe to people to sleep then here on on the middle there is a small bathroom uh and also a sleeping area and on the top again another sleeping area The foundations are portable you could see before the the the, the foundations that were um uh, brought to Milano so also here there were these foundations and just simply you can hide them uh, in the soil of course the tower is quite uh, uh, tall so it has uh, a wind uh, force strong uh, so the foundation needs to be very very strong the furniture creates also a things like a staircase between the units and so on so everything is really uh, designed minimalistic in a way that it has more functions this is the bathroom quite simple all done just in one piece of uh, roast fry stainless steel the lights are simple these little crosses that you have on the walls are magnets where you can just put the light and it gets electricity from there and you can move the lights around the house as you want okay then the building was moved to london where they asked us to exhibit it as a part of uh, london design week and it was a part of discussion uh, does a home have to be permanent or large in london such as in other large cities um, they are lately dealing quite a lot with the questions that the land is so so expensive then no local can afford anymore to 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 buy an apartment of, of a decent size in the city center so in london especially all these places are mainly bought by arabs or rich russians and so on and not from londoners or from from normal people who you know go to work <laughs> middle class basically so they uh they talk a lot lately on how big a home must be of course there are some minimum standards that are prescribed from each um, from each country um, Slovenia also has minimum standard what can be the minimum size of the kitchen the bathroom the bedroom and so on and so on and here they are trying to change this minimum standard in order to be able to offer also uh, people smaller scale apartments so in a way it was a provocation how small a home can be where it can stand so that people can basically afford um, to live in the city center in a way quite a sad question but yeah uh, so then it was sold on eBay 
uh, and then the money was donated to to uh, architecture association uh, in London uh, and the building today got a new home it's in Scotland in this beautiful hill where the client who bought it uh, refurbished inside into a home so this is how it looks now for me it was quite shocking but in a way nice how <laughs> how buildings can get all these different uh, interiors so this is now the final look of our building uh, in scotland uh, so this uh, this research of of these small cabins also led us to uh, an interesting project in the desert of spain where the client was a glass company who asked us a simple question could you design a glass house uh, in the middle of the desert where someone can live without air conditioning just to prove to the Spanish and also everyone else that uh, our glass that we are producing can be so good that uh, it can also deal with some very you know harsh climate like that and then we said oh yes of course we it's an interesting question and we called uh, these uh, colleagues uh, structural engineers from london akt and transolar uh, the company from um from Munich who uh, who joined venture with us to to create this research project uh, so basically the glass is a kind of a hero uh, of this project in all uh, terms it creates structure so there are no columns it's just glass it creates furniture it creates envelope uh, uh, the cladding also of course photovoltaic on top is glass but otherwise the project is quite simple the the, the hair, um, i mean the the area is really harsh it has plus 50 degrees centigrade in summer and then it has snow in winter and then of course it has very strong winds as well so the structure have to be done in a way that it can um, uh, you know that it can survive all these influences so this is the foundation again portable cubes the the, the complete building was done in Slovenia and then taken to to Spain then it has these two wooden decks I will show you later in the section uh, uh, right no so basically this part and this part is made of wood and the wood is done in this way it's like a structure that is normally used in ships uh, so it's kind of glued in in two directions uh, and of course since the building needs to be taken by a normal truck all this is uh, you can disassemble so each piece was done that you can disassemble and put it together and together it creates this uh, solid uh, structure then it has uh, wooden cladding and on top it has the roof so uh, the roof part and the the, the 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 floor slab are done in this uh, wooden way so these are the images from the construction i will also show you the video so this was assembled also quite quickly and of course they couldn't use really heavy heavy duty machinery uh, so all the trucks had to be in the size that they can come to this uh, to this area which is quite abundant and very very small path leads to to the area under the building uh, the building is lifted so this black stuff is the the foundation and between the foundation there is a water container we um, we um, uh, take the water from the roof and uh, put it in the container of course in summer this water is not enough of water so they also need to bring it by by a tractor and they place water inside the container but also here we have batteries for photovoltaic and the small cleaning sewage device to to clean the the, the toilet stuff basically in the showers so this is then the views the view is really beautiful around so it has this 360 degree view around the the desert where basically you can see all around the shading actually is not needed because of the of the heat it's mainly needed to create intimacy inside because if you imagine you are alone inside here uh, in the night it can be a little bit weird so you can enclose yourself uh, you know there were stories when for example a lot of people rent these houses and uh, at some point we were told there were these girls who rented the the space and they were putting their uh, you know selfies on Instagram and then at some point at 2 a.m. Uh, uh, 
two lights from the car started to approach. Of course, here you can see all the stars and then these lights from the car you can see from very, very far away. And then they got super scared who's coming. Uh, of course, they were these nice girls half, you know, half dressed uh, on Instagram. And uh, okay, at the end, they were visited by uh, two local policemen who wanted to check out the, you know, the girls. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, I can imagine without the curtains, it's a little bit uh yeah scary <laughs> so uh but otherwise the the building is done in a way that you have this roof cantilevered uh which uh, creates the sun doesn't really enter but otherwise the the glazing is triple glazing and it has a special coating on top um which you don't see with your eyes, but it provides that the sun does not ever directly come inside. So it can keep the interior cold and the exterior when the exterior is very hot. So these are all these details of glass walls. Uh, we were measuring the temperature and all the effects. So they say that when it was plus 50 degrees outside, inside without air conditioning, it was only plus 28 degrees which is quite good. But of course, since people rent it, uh, it's a nice retreat. Uh, they got uh, also air conditioning. These holes in the structure, as you can see, are the holes that people can come with a screwdriver and put together these wooden decks. So they make a solid um, deck all together. The landscape is really nice. It's this national park also, very close to Granada. So it's triple glazing. As you can see, there are no columns between. So the glass enters the wooden deck and uh, it creates also structural stability both for the wind and uh, for the um, for for basically all forces on the top you can see the photovoltaics and the most expensive element of this building were actually the batteries. I was not aware how expensive batteries can be and all the batteries are hidden inside the inside this uh, between the foundation. Okay. Uh, part of our research were also these bivacs, uh, small shelters that uh, we did in the mountain. We have a new bivac just now. We did it this year. Uh, I don't have yet the photos, but this is also an interesting uh, topic to research because it needs to be a very small building that needs to offer space for up to between six or eight people maximum. Uh, had to be brought on the site by a helicopter and the research we did, we did a lot of shapes. Uh, uh, for example, this, this building here is made completely of wood. So the structure is wood and the structure also creates um, uh, a kind of um, uh, interior furniture and also creates the uh, thermal uh, isolation. Uh, but otherwise, with this particular building, we had quite a lot of problems uh, already during the transport. Uh, it's things that you cannot predict that in the area uh, around these mountains, there is very, very high turbulence. So we had to tra try to transport this building three times. You can see here we are using uh, the army. Army uh, worked together with us as sponsors. Uh, because they um, uh, they offered free transport to to the as a part of their training in a way, 
and the building just didn't stop moving as you can see it's rotating all the time and it's uh, the pilot needs to stop the building just before uh, he positions it on the on the very end uh, during the construction the installation the people who install the building are standing here in the peak and have to pull the building down and put it exactly on four anchors so it's a very precise moment to catch uh, and here in this area it was very very difficult so we had three attempts to to do it and in the third attempt it worked and then the building for three or four years it, it was great as you can see the 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 view is just perfect you can see venice from here in the clear sky uh, the coast all slovenia basically uh, but then uh, this uh, spring someone crashed the window <laughs> so that's really for us a disaster because to change the window means that you need to uh, bring again the big glass all the way up we don't know if it was done on purpose or not it's hard to say but it's a very very big damage and now we are trying to 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 um, solve the damage so the building was closed then uh, during uh, summer and now we are trying to to change that so yeah but somehow this very nice building didn't really have a lot of luck where uh, for example this other building we did uh, this building we did together with the students uh, at harvard at harvard we were teaching we started to teach during the crisis and then we were teaching for six seven years and uh, this year again we run a studio it's a great space with a lot of uh, people coming from everywhere a lot of culture different culture exchange uh, of all knowledge and so on and so on like so many experts from everywhere uh, so it's a very nice uh, uh, kind of education also for us to share knowledge in space like that uh, so these are for example some photos of our studios normally take three and a half months this year because of covid they did a seven uh, week uh, studio shorten up like they offered more studios uh, to students uh, so we were dealing of course with covid this year but um, uh, the year i'm showing it was about manila and some structures in manila also uh, here we were dealing with uh, kind of different proposals going from the uh, urban uh, scale uh, all the way down to the details uh, and then uh, some students even did the prototypes one-to-one -one. like for example this area here it's called Baseco it's an area where uh, there is um, uh, very very poor uh, people living uh, of course black uh, black market and illegal buildings made on this uh, piece of earth that was garbage basically is garbage put on the on the sea and they live on this garbage because they also collect garbage uh, plastic boxes and uh, bottles and so on for their living so we were doing kind of what you can do in this area how to to do the water how to deal with sewage how to deal with um, reinforcing the ground and so on and so on uh, and then at the end uh, like different proposals some of them we even built the structure and then donated them to the local uh, people uh, and one of our studio was also devoted to uh, this bivax uh, because it's a nice project for students to learn because they have to deal with all this structure and sustainability and minimalistic interior it's a lot of a lot of things in a small building like that uh, easy for students to understand so after the projects were done we were looking for a site in slovenia we got in contact again with the mountaineers and we were offered this nice site it's Skuta Mountain where there was old bivak before that needed to be replaced uh, and then we placed there this uh, building made of three uh, prototypes three elements uh, here you can see how you deal, do the foundation uh, it's simple methods you have to make a hole and then you drill you put water inside and you wait for one day and if the water is gone it means that the soil is not uh, solid if the water stays there it means that uh, you are okay and this is where you can put your anchor so it's kind of simple methods like that uh, here you can see the the transport uh, three elements because Slovenian helicopter can take only about 1,300 kilos per 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 um, 
right? And of course, each building needs to be almost uh, completed because it's very hard to complete it on top with, in this extreme condition without uh, a lot of uh, tools. Uh, so this is the inside, again, glass overlooking the beautiful surrounding, the beautiful view, simple interior with beds uh, and area for the, for the uh, preparing meals and so on and so on. So this building was simple to, um, to install, uh, maybe because also the shape is kind of uh, more um, like in a way shape that it can go up with the pressure of the of the um, air uh, and basically the building was assembled in three hours uh, and all in one go. Also the building we just placed now in, in another mountain, I was explaining you, we finished one a new shelter about uh, three weeks ago, I think, was also done very, very simply. So just with that canine, for some reason, was not uh, luck. But yeah, some projects are more easy, some projects are more difficult. So this is how it goes. Army offers only maybe four or five rights, that's it, because they need to calculate. They, they come here from their airport and they need to have uh, uh, kerosene, the gas inside. They should not have too much because otherwise they are too heavy and they should just have enough for as many rights as we arrange. Uh, so if something goes wrong, then they go back to the airport and they don't come back anymore <laughs> that day. Maybe then you have to ask them to come in a month or two. So you have to predict all these little details that sometimes are not easy. Here, I don't know if you see, but one rope broke. One rope broke. No, here not, in one of the elements. But luckily, it was OK. We were very scared what to do. but. We said, okay, let's just try and uh, it worked, thankfully. This is, I think, our last slide for today. So I will keep it till the end and then we can finish and I am able to answer any of your questions as you might have. Ah, okay. Yeah, maybe I have here a little bit of our current projects, but uh, wait, let me see. No, I think I will finish with this slide and let's have new projects that we have for, for the next time. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> no, you just, um, perfectly, it was one hour. <laughs> Thank you, Shola, okay. very much. Yes. It's really exciting to, to see all the, all the projects. Uh, we will now um, have the, you, dear students, will now have an opportunity to ask your questions. So we, we do it in that way that they are writing it and putting it in a chat and then we will read it for you and, and uh, we can discuss those topics. But uh, before they start, I would, uh, as always, misuse my, my position and ask us first. <laughs> so, um, there was. Uh, I start from the from the end actually because this was this is really a kind of, of very um, how to say um, topic uh, interesting topic uh, to build in a, in such extreme situations in a, in a landscapes that are uh, in most cases protected and uh, quite uh, how to say ambitious when we are talking about the, the natural conditions of them. So. Um, the question is, uh, do we have actually a uh, right or is it okay that we are so um, still so ambitious to, to put our work in, in this uh, kind of natural landscapes? Is, is it okay or is it a little bit like uh, that we are somehow 
testing what the nature allowed us and the, the, because we have this discussion in Slovakia right now uh, what, how to build in mountains what amount of building should be done there and etc so and your country is quite small you don't have so much of, of, of the nature so yeah I, I can <laughs> answer that easily basically in also our also in our country there are these restrictions so mainly all the buildings we are doing uh, like the bivacs we are doing are replacing old bivacs that either were there and got demolished because of, of fire or you know the one that we just replaced now was eaten by some kind of wood mushroom uh, in the past but um, it's allowed to build in this uh, national um, preserved site but from these national parks only if there was a building there before not not uh, it, it's not allowed to build a new build building but only if the building stood there before then you are allowed to uh, to create and replace it so this was the the uh, for example the uh, uh, the scuta that I showed uh, just now and the building that I couldn't show you yet because I don't have the, the photos yet and we are doing just right now another building uh, which is a weather the, a weather observation station that uh, stands um, just below Triglau. Triglau is our highest uh, mountain so it has this special place where um, there was an old weather station before and now we are demolishing it and we are rebuilding a new building but again restrictions from the heritage are strict you are not allowed to make it larger you are not in volume meaning uh, larger volume you are not to uh, able to put more beds inside as they were before you have to show how you do with uh, infrastructure uh, you know like garbage um, uh, sewage uh, and so on and so on and uh, etc so the Canin mountain was a little bit different because there was some kind of remaining uh, in the area that we placed it but there is a cottage next to it so this was also a kind of it's a kind of winter cabin when the cottage is closed you can use that as a kind of winter shelter uh, so that was also allowed but always we have very very big discussions with the heritage in Spain the 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 what was arranged was that we also talked to a heritage we had to hire a local Spanish architect because we needed a construction permit for that small building just because of all these restrictions of the environmental uh, people so the building is not permanent as we showed you it has foundations that were simply just put on the ground it has no pipes nothing nothing in the ground so basically we didn't touch the ground at all we just placed the building we we uh, assembled it uh, it was maybe two days altogether to finish the interior and then after now it was arranged first to take it away if, for, uh, in one year but then later this building was so popular that even the local villagers from the village that is close to this area ask the government that if the building can stay for a while so I think now it's still there. I'm, I'm not really now familiar what happens right now in this in this month, for example. In summer, it was still there, uh, and but they will uh, uh, take it somewhere else. The idea is either they will sell it or donate it to someone and uh, take it somewhere there. So the condition was not to touch the ground at all. So so this is what we respected. Also, in the castle where the, the, our building was there, set just for for basically four months in summer I think it was also we got conditions from the heritage we could uh, put a, four little holes for the for the foundation but foundation was brought as prefab element put on the ground and then we had to uh, put the soil back and put the grass and uh, yeah that's it so basically we have to talk and, and I think it's correct that uh, you know sometimes we get this uh, crazy I mean not crazy in a way uh, you know restrictions from the local um, environmentalist or heritage which in a way you never think of but then you think of it's really nice that someone thinks of that as well for example <laughs> I don't know now we are doing one hotel uh, in also in a national park a big hotel and we are reconstructing the road and they were explaining us these heritage people how you can 
built retaining walls around the around the uh, road and of course we didn't think of that but they said you know retaining walls made of natural stone they create habitat for you know for snakes for little animals like all this kind of uh, stuff and then it, you have to build it like that like that like that so that it can create habitat also for all these uh, things so basically you know and then they said okay look there is a frog here who is restricted a special frog bats i don't know all sorts of stuff so in a way it's uh you know you talk to the people and you try to to listen to them because in a way it's nice and it's correct that you have to to take all this stuff into consideration yeah of course yeah thank yeah. you yeah yes thank you uh, but i still have to ask regarding this uh cabins and shelters that um you know i kind of struggle with the main idea that is that um uh, you build something that is very um uh, innovative and uh, it's in, in this extreme ambient but it serves to people to like just go there for a couple of days to rent it and to you know like it's in, it's a retreat in nature to kind of like reconnect but it's in this very small uh, posh looking capsule so <laughs> like did you have any kind of discussion in the background of, of uh, what is the actual purpose of, of these shelters? Yeah, no, the shelters are not not uh, there. I mean, I was talking to to rent and so on. It's the the glass house we did in Spain. That's let's say a particular project with a brief like that. Uh, it's a research how to do you know uh, a kind of glass house in the desert. And of course, client wanted to rent it because uh, because um, they wanted to get feedback from the people uh, how they feel inside. That was the purpose of this project. And actually, the rent. It was really cheap. It was mainly about uh, costs of bringing the water in the tank, cleaning the stuff before the new people come, putting the bed linen and so on and so on. So it was really not expensive thing to rent. But then the shelters in the mountains are a different story. This is not something you rent. It's a shelter. Uh, Bivak is a culture that we have in Slovenia. Everyone can come there. It's a free free uh, building that stands there and you can whoever wants can come there and stay the night and leave uh, the only request is that you clean after yourself all the garbage and everything and normally normally uh, people maintain it well there are some people who come uh, you know and stay there for three days with a box of beer but <laughs> they are normally there uh, you know this is not the proper way of using the the culture of bivak we have it in slovenia i think i was explained for 80 years already it's uh, it's also um taken care by volunteers and it's a culture uh, that that is here uh, it doesn't exist for example in america forget about something like that but uh, here in slovenia they still they still have this culture and i think it's nice so it's a it's a free stay for everyone and it's normally in in abandoned areas for example in canine area mainly uh, the researchers of local caves stayed inside it's an area that uh, has a long walk so in a way you have to spend the night and then you can go further so so it's not really a kind of luxurious retreat that you pay someone and so on and so on mm -hmm. it's a it's a very different story yeah. so and actually we have the same uh, uh, tradition of, of uh, bivak here in, in our mountains in high tatra and carpathian mountains so uh, we perfectly understood that it's only that uh, for example the the cases that are developed in our country are really very raw it's like very raw material and like uh, you know so this was the question that uh, uh, this yeah. is perfect uh, stuff might be easily distracted uh, by the way are you hiking as well or yeah the sure <laughs> very oh. much yeah. <laughs> no I, I think i just uh, had this uh, misunderstanding because uh, <laughs> i've actually seen the, the house in the desert i've seen it in my favorite uh a series that's called black mirror yeah um, you've seen the episode and uh, it was used as a uh, that there was this uh, head of the something like Facebook, the CEO, and he was having his meditational retreat 
in the middle of the desert. So I think that sort of ruined my vision of how these buildings are used. Because yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> no, this this glass house work was quite popular after after <laughs> it was placed there really like, like a kind of a research, and the idea was uh, still is to rent it by uh, you know by by normal people to get feedback, uh, because the point was to get the feedback if the building actually works. Uh, but then of course since it is quite attractive, it was rented by 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 some others like the Black Mirror, and there are I think there are some commercials for I don't know Massimo yes. Dutti, and I don't know they were like I think I heard of three com commercials quite exclusive that were also filmed inside there. But yeah, I mean. Come up. We, are, we are glad you explained it. <laughs> it's a little bit more now we understand. I and didn't uh, know about this black mirror. I got a link from a student <laughs> of mine. Uh, and then later we saw that uh, a lot of people shared that. So, yeah, okay. But, uh, we have a question from a student. So now we stop asking. Yeah, sure. And uh, uh, so Matush uh, says, firstly, I'd like to thank you for the presentation. And uh, I want to ask, what would you say is uh, typical for your architectural style or even what is unique uh, about it? I, 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 it's hard for me to say if there is, but definitely with what we tried to do is what also I tried to explain you through this lecture, that we try to find something that makes us different and special from, from, from you know, the global architecture that you can find uh, everywhere. It's also something we try to teach our students, mainly students coming from Asia or, or United States who really have problems with identity, like, uh, you know, being proud or or even knowing the culture where they come from the history and all the all the you know like the cultural uh, positive things um so I, I would say we really try hard uh, to, in a way, influence, uh, to, to, in a way, put that in our architecture, especially if we work on, on this Alpine architecture that is special in Slovenia. Of course, it's more difficult if you do in Ljubljana, in the middle of the city center, like, okay, how different is Ljubljana from Bratislava or from Prague, or, you know, it has some similarities in a way. So you cannot even say this is really Ljubljana style and we have to appreciate it and so on and so on. But when we, when we work in in the countryside we tried to really uh, study the local culture, the the the, the specificity of the site, uh, of course, of the program. We have budget restrictions and so on and so on. And then uh, uh, somehow architecture and cre creativity comes out of that. Okay. But I think this is very important because, you know, nowadays when I was a student, we didn't have Instagram or, or you know, all this, like now you can really just, uh, you know, okay, just check on Pinterest and you get immediately images and images and images. And then normally, you know, students are lost in all this, what was already done with all these inspirations. And uh, somehow I think it's important to, in a way, appreciate where you come from and make your work special and different from anyone else. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, Bianca says, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very inspiring. Uh, what are your thoughts on micro living? Do you think that tiny apartments can provide a proper living standard in the long term? Ah, that's a quite hard question because in a way, you know, when I explain that this is in a way a uh, solution for expensive uh, properties in London, I don't think this is correct because I think what is correct is that the cities should offer and somehow find uh, the way, you know, also for middle class to, to, to find their um, areas not to be you know, pulled into suburbs. So it's it's a broader question not to be solved uh, only by architects, but mainly by, by the government and the economists and so on. Uh, the question, what is going to happen with the cities like London if, if the property is just simply so expensive that no one can afford to live in the center anymore? I mean, are we just going to have Airbnb facilities or, or, or just, uh, you know, like this, uh, renting uh, apartments owned by Air rich Arabs and so on. Uh, so I don't think it's a, it's really a proper solution. But in a way, like I said, it was a provocation. Uh, uh, 
to talk about that and also to maybe rethink that maybe some apartments can be small. I don't think it's a proper apartment for a family, but may maybe uh, as a combination for someone who lives, uh, who works in the city and then lives uh, somewhere else and uh, kind of uh, commutes uh, on the weekends uh, between home and uh, this kind of non-permanent home in the city, maybe this is something that uh, is possible. In that way, we were uh, discussing this uh, micro living. Uh, and of course, there are some new ways of living as, as well that uh, are not very traditional and they can be discussed also, but it's a very broad discussion, I think. <laughs> so an interesting topic, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, apparently something that uh, our students find really interesting. And uh, so another student is uh, developing this even more. What do you think is socially more sustainable to share the living or having uh, our tiny living? To share the living or having? Uh, or having this kind of tiny living. I think, um, I don't know, it's a question to be discussed. Of course, some people have opinion like that. Some people have opinion like that, but for sure there are, um, there it would be interesting uh, projects that for example you can share certain certain rooms certain facilities inside the apartment between broader community but then have the intimate spaces uh, just for yourself so a kind of aggregations of that sense uh, could make sense for example again if i mention london because last year we were there a lot we were teaching in london last year uh, there was i don't know if you have this we work uh, communities in in slovakia in bratislava already but there in London this is a quite successful um, module where actually you can rent your office uh, it's like beautiful offices made by by a company we work or, or similar companies they are more like that now and then you can rent either an office or only a table or and you can rent it uh, permanently for two years or you can rent it just uh, for five hours like a presentation room to present something to your client and so on and so on so in a way, maybe how uh, housing also has a similar potential, especially in big cities like that, like we work, we we live, or something like that. That uh, it's uh, it could be an interesting research again. So, and I think it's um, maybe not in Bratislava or Ljubljana. We live differently, I think, but in this kind of cities where things change uh, fast and where there's a lot of people who come, go, and change, and so on, like London. Uh, New York, like big cities, Hong Kong, and so on. These are definitely kind of uh, modules for living to be to be explored. Yeah, I would like to develop a little bit more this kind of question of housing because, uh, uh, as you you have shown this uh, this uh, sketches of of uh, housing uh, blocks that are actually all a little bit like similar. That the housing is really a typology which tends to be. Um, tends to unification, etc., etc. So uh, when you compare your um, experiences with housing uh, in a, for developers, like in this uh, private sector, with uh, social housing, um, what are the main um, differences or specificities of, of these different uh, investors, actually? Yeah, I mean, mainly these investors, unfortunately, they have all the same uh, brief, um, not very creative. So normally they want, I don't know, 20% of one bedroom apartment, 40% of two bedroom apartment and so on and so on. So all the same brief because, of course, there is a market who has demands more or less similar. Uh, then they have these sites that, like I showed, more or less ur urbanistically prescribed uh, cubes. Uh, so and then normally they all have the same limited budget so sometimes it happens that we need to sign the contract with the client that before they uh, sign the contract with the contractor uh, if the budget gets higher uh, from what it was told to us in the at, the at the beginning we must change free of charge the plans in order to achieve the the budget limitation which is a very difficult uh, task so what we normally do in social housing is that we try to really do floor plans very very rational we don't waste uh, time um, space with uh, 
you know, like common spaces, shared spaces, interior spaces, like things that uh, take uh, corridors and so on and so on, uh, because they 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 put on budget, but they don't provide uh, selling uh, surface or the profit. And then this money that somehow uh, we save on that, we also try to use quite simple materials for the east side. But in that money that we saved from the inside, then we try to do a little bit something more from this facade. Not only facade, but meaning the whole area between the outside and the inside with these uh, lojas balconies. In Slovenia, people normally they come from the countryside, like my grandmother, they had the farm, everyone basically, grandmother either lived on the countryside or on the farm. There are very few people who lived in the city for generations. So we all have that attachment somehow with nature and with green and with soil and with gardens. So we really believe that uh, every apartment should have a balcony which proved as a very positive element, especially now in COVID, where balconies somehow in Slovenia, also in Italy and elsewhere, became really a space a connection between the, the inside of the apartment and the public and between the neighbors and so on. So uh, you can see that in each of our housing projects, the balcony is something special. Uh, and uh, this is where we tried then to focus the budget on and this is also what makes the buildings then different from each other so <laughs> thank you thank you we have plenty of questions from from student side so monica please <laughs> yes i don't even know where to begin but okay igor uh right uh while you all talking about uh the uh the hotel intercontinental you said everything was prescribed in advance and that um, they were the, the certain requirements. Um, do you think we have all our rights and freedom as architects to do our job in that kind of project? Yeah, it's a hard question. I, I, I think after after this experience, we said we will never work for a hotel chain again. <laughs> now, now we are working on two hotels in the in the office. Um, uh, and uh, it's not a hotel chain, it's a client who wants to do a boutique hotel, it's a special hotel and we discuss with the client together what should be the spirit, uh, you know, what should be something to be brought to the client. We try to integrate the local community, again, elements like some things that are very local inside. So basically all that we did not uh, agree somehow with when we did the intercontinental we try to 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 do now in this particular hotel uh, that is going to be opened now in summer it's in bohin area um yeah but sometimes you know the clients uh, I, I don't know what will happen if, if again a client comes to us and says I don't know I want to do Ritz Hotel or I don't know what I guess we will read and see if we want to do it or not because at the end really there are so many restrictions uh, that as a creative architect it's not much you can do at the final uh, spot but uh, still uh, this building is uh, on the on the main it's like a gate to the city it's it's a skyscraper i mean skyscraper a tower for slovenian scale a skyscraper uh, uh, and it was an interesting uh, project in some way but to to deal with the restricted brief like that uh, i must say that uh, it's not a very very creative uh, experience but you really wanted to remain contextual um, yeah somehow. sure we yeah. tried our best i must say yes. i think we we did we pulled out our best what we could so <laughs> <laughs> and that is kind of also the next question by matur uh when you work on a project in abroad how much do you study the location its characteristics history inhabitants culture etc how much does it influence your concept and ideas yeah, again, I would say it would really depend on, on a location and project itself. I think at the moment, cities uh, around the globe are already so, in a way, generic that, of course, there is some local influence that we like to integrate, but then 
you know, the most specific things can happen in the countryside still, in the periphery of the cities. So if we would be ever offered a job, uh, you know, in the countryside somewhere, definitely we would study very much the, the local heritage and try to see uh, what could be our approach as foreigners coming from elsewhere, but with a little bit of local touch. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm sorry we are trying to, to <laughs> go through the questions and somehow combine them because uh, actually there is one question that touches the, the same problem. Uh, if, uh, how it is when you are working in a, in a foreign country? Uh, do you pay extra attention or on the other hand are you more brave and uh, like experimenting uh, when you are abroad and not in, in Ljubljana for example? No, of course, when you get out, I mean, when you work abroad, uh, you, you know, you, there are things you don't know, there are determinations you don't know here. When we are at home, somehow we know what we can expect from the, you know, it's not so easy between the first sketches of the building and the concept and then getting a construction permit and then building. So it, it gets, the project gets through so many restrictions and phases that, um, it's hard to say, you know, it's not always the sketch that can be built at the end because of many, many restrictions. So, you know, getting construction permit is normally a big task to do. You have to deal with a lot of people, a lot of opinions, restrictions and so on and so on. So basically, of course, if you are, if we are in Ljubljana, we know restrictions very well. We also know how to avoid or maybe how to find gray zones in the restrictions that we can actually explain to the to the guys who are giving permissions but you know it's actually not written like that it's written and it allows also that and la da da so in a way it's easier to have the dialogue uh, than when you are abroad of course the local the local um Restrictions you don't know so well, and then you must either rely on luck or you must rely on on a, on a, on an, on other people that you hire from there and their kind of way how they they can understand and explain uh, that your project um, answers all the restrictions that have to be done. So uh, it's much easier to work at home than abroad. But of course, each work abroad also is uh, something to be proud of, and it's a, it's a nice challenge. Okay, uh, there is a, another question that regards the designing process. So uh, Bianca is asking, what is your creative process? Do you ever get stuck while creating your designs? And if so, what is your advice in these situations? Yeah, of course we get stuck. Uh, you know, it depends. Some projects that just emerge like that in, in one afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and then the first idea, everyone who, who works on it thinks, wow, yes, that's it, let's just proceed and that's it. And then normally, if, if it happens like that, then this idea really is the best and you just go for it and, and that's it. But sometimes it's hard and you do something and you don't really like it or, or, or it doesn't really work because of whatever functional reasons or, or restrictions or anything. And then you try alternative and alternative. Sometimes really in some projects, we even do 10 or 15 variations like in 3D volume and then we narrow it and we said, okay, look, these three are interesting, uh, but maybe we didn't try that, we didn't try that. So times, sometimes it took two, three weeks just before we really chose uh, choose the kind of volume that we want to work with and then we go for that one and then I must say that if things get so complicated that the end you are not satisfied with any of this stuff then the project <laughs> at the end gets bad karma and it just doesn't work so I don't know what to say when you get stuck sometimes you just go home and oversleep and then two days after is better sometimes you print out you put the paper on the wall you look at it uh, and then maybe you see something with different eyes it's different, uh, you know, different ways, but uh, it sometimes always comes the solution. So, <laughs> yeah, just don't worry. Just if you get really stuck, I think something is wrong. You must uh, do it different. So <laughs> that's my advice. 
Thank you. I, I would ask so much more, but this is about our students, so I'll go on with the next question. Uh, Karina brought, uh, thank you for the presentation. It is funny that you have started with big stadiums and you ended up with a small pilax at the end of your presentation. Usually the studio starts with very small proposals and then gets to the big, bigger projects later on. So my question is, what is a challenge uh, for you right now? Or what are your ambitions after all of this experience that you already have? Well, I would say that the challenge and ambition is that we really want to do stuff that makes us happy. <laughs> that's, the, that's the biggest challenge because there is a lot of work and then there are in mainly in big projects, of course, you, it's not always everything fun and, and enjoyable. It's also very, very hard moments. Uh, and it's harder and harder. I must say at the beginning of our career, people, I'm not sure if it was the same in Slovakia, but somehow in the construction site, in the in the people are were a little bit more relaxed, a little bit less bureaucratic and uh, scared, and a little bit less just about the money, right? More and more, I would say, uh, in the last two three years, it's bureaucracy is getting crazy. Um, the the money demands money, money profit. It's getting really sick, and uh, the relation then uh, between everyone, the client, the construction site, like everyone who's pressed, really is not enjoyable anymore. And somehow, somehow, I think the biggest challenge for us now in this transition again, I think it, again somehow we are going through a kind of transition here in Slovenia. In, in the culture of construction um, is a challenge how we will deal with it and how we will survive not to lose joy in architecture because what can happen at the end of the day dealing with uh, people and the projects like that is that you just really lose joy and that's not the point I think really the work the architecture is about enjoying your work and if you enjoy your work then you can do it well and I must say, this is for us now the biggest challenge in, in bigger scale projects. Uh, how to deal with this transition that I feel it's, it's happening again. I don't know, is this influence from the West? Uh, uh, influence is it just about economic greed? I, 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 I'm I'm not sure what to say, but definitely not only me, also my, my colleagues, we feel that um, uh, the relations changed uh, and not in a good way. So we'll see. <laughs> So the challenge, you must enjoy your work. That's 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 what we want to do. Yeah, I mean, you are perfectly right because we have uh, had a, a, a festival in architecture a few weeks ago and there was Adam Caruso speaking about his um, experience of, of designing right now and he said that it's not possible to to enjoy uh, doing architecture in Britain anymore. That uh, yeah. he really prefers to build in, in the old Europe because it doesn't work, so it comes from West, probably. <laughs> probably, yes. <laughs> probably, yes. <laughs> That's a beautiful message to our students, like always to remember to enjoy. Exactly, yeah. That's my point. Uh, <laughs> we have a beautiful, interesting question that was also somewhere in my mind. So, uh, Thea is asking, um, there is a big discussion nowadays about ethics of architects who collaborate with authoritarian authoritarian regimes. Personally, I don't agree with the critics. Thinking of the project in uh, Bela Belarus, uh, what is your stand on that? Because there's yeah. pictures of uh, Lukashenko. Yeah, it's a question we discussed at that point and also we, we had a very interesting project. I didn't show it today because we have just a lot of projects, but this uh, spring we were invited to do a project in Saudi Arabia where actually the, the situation, if you ask me, is even worse. And uh, it was a project, uh, we did it at the end. Uh, and also we discussed because we got invited uh, four architects, one from the UK, one from Spain, one from Norway and us, we were invited to do uh, 
kind of housing proposal on the master plan that was done by BIC, by BRK Ingels, uh, in the sea of Saudi Arabia. It's a city called Neom. It's a kind of new city in the sea um, where, you know, everything will be sustainable and there will be whatever this kind of new um, uh, farms on the sea and uh, you know factories like super new new um, uh, like uh, like like in a movie in a way futuristic movie so basically a very interesting task but then at the end the client was Saudi Arabian and of course we completely disagree with the politics and everything there you know also whatever with the even with the relation with the woman and like <laughs> everything is wrong basically and then we were discussing also we invited again our partners from from uh, uh, Germany the Transolar and our UK uh, structure engineer uh, Hanif Kara and we had a big meeting about that before we said yes uh, like is it is it ethic or is it not ethnic you know to work for a client like that but then at the end you know who who the project is for you know like the government is there and then it goes away and then the building stay for people right like this building in in uh, for example the the football stadium i never felt it was done for lukashenko actually okay lukashenko came at the start to make a, a stone like for the beginning of the construction site and then he came at the end for the opening but never ever he was mentioned even from the people who who were constructing it that he, this is the guy who's the patriot of our building it was about the local football team who is very good and it's great that someone from such a restricted co country like uh, you know like belarus can play uh, in this uh, you know league or uh, european league and so on and so on like they were super good at that time uh, and basically it was for local people who really have nothing i mean really this place boriso uh, uh, I, I was very sad <laughs> to go there it reminded me a lot of, of my childhood. Of course, in Slovenia, we lived much, much better than, than they do now, for example, in this small city. Uh, uh, but really, there was no no square, no public space, nowhere. Just I don't know where people go there to, to meet or, or, or socialize. And in a way, my attitude is that this is building for the for the city, for the people of the city and for the local football team, not for, for the government. The government will be there and maybe at some point will not be there anymore and the building will stay. And this is the same discussion we had about the, the Saudi Arabian project. I mean, um, you know, so so that's my, of course, if we would be asked to do, you know, I don't know, a jail or, or some kind of building for, you know, <laughs> that has kind of corrupt uh, meaning uh of course we we would never say yes but if it's about housing if it's about the public facilities for the citizen i don't think it's wrong that that you do it yeah i mean uh, the, the question is also how much the authoritarian regime is speaking about architecture if they are somehow influencing you in your uh, way no not at all no no that's actually interesting uh, also question for us because for example in ljubljana one of uh, of course we had plechnik uh, uh, and then after plechnik in the 70s and late 60s we had very very good architecture in the in the in the middle of the socialistic regime of uh, let's say you know to totalitarian regime we had the best architecture uh, and in a way they never i mean why i i ask myself why right probably because somehow at that point politicians didn't ask okay i see whatever you know some building uh, whatever i don't know in london and i want to have exactly the same building it's it was never discussion it was about trusting the 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 um the architects the structural engineers that they are experts and they should do do it well um what was maybe good at that point was mainly about public spaces because at that time um you know everything was belonged to everyone so if someone decided let's make a square of revolution here a square of revolution was done it was not a question who whose land is that whose land is that um 
now basically to do any big uh, public building in Ljubljana is basically impossible because every time they want to do it, someone comes and says, oh no, this is potentially my land, it was my land at some point and then, uh, you know, maybe it was true, maybe it was not true, but you start to deal with so many neighbors and, and private, uh, you know, um, it's almost impossible like you want to do a biking route and you cannot do it because one guy just simply doesn't allow the biking route to go by his property and that's it and it doesn't happen and so in some way i must say that maybe the regime in these terms it, it had good impact especially on public space which now almost is impossible but of course you know everything has its positive and negative sides so it's hard to judge uh, absolutely, and we are facing now this big discussion on, on uh, um, protection of these uh, landmarks, architectural landmarks in Slovakia and Ljubljana as well. Uh, I was showing to students uh, beautiful architecture of Ivan Burnik on, on the introductory lecture, so we know what, what you are talking about. This yeah. was really this was not, not like uh, adoring the, the authoritarian regime, but of course... Not at all, yeah. It yeah. was a unique opportunity, yeah. <laughs> yeah somehow in Slovenia, somehow in Slovenia at that time really, in a way, it was always luck. Also, Plechnik was architect of the regime. He was, you know, selected by, by, by the mayor at that time and he did everything. But somehow, luckily, <laughs> he's a great architect and everything he did was just great. So the same, it was in the 70s. So somehow, you know, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes. Th thank you. We, we we agree so much. This is a very interesting topic, and I and I liked a lot what you said about the working for the authoritarian regimes because uh, once the commission is there, then somebody will do it. So if you refuse this opportunity, then some some other architect will come and in the end make the project. So what you can do as a service to the public. It's like take this project and make it as best as you can to exactly as you said, like to serve the local people, to have some another edit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But you, you have mentioned Joseph Fletching only three times during your lecture. <laughs> <laughs> I have counted it because normally uh, all of the other Slovenian architects, they referred to, to Joseph Fletching several times. So my last question would be today, what is your attitude to your reflecting and if uh, in your architecture if you somehow reflect it reflect his ideas or his uh, architecture yeah sure yeah of course i mean we admire him and his work very very much i didn't mention him because i know that they were calling presenting before me and i guess they mentioned plichnik before and i also think that you know slovakia somehow is so close to ljubljana that people know plichnik well of course when I give lecture, you know, you know, in Asia or in the United States, I always mention Plechnik because mainly people don't even know him. But here I didn't on purpose. Uh, but yes, Plechnik for us is very special. And there are mainly, of course, we admire his talent for, you know, composition, relations, uh, materials, everything. Basically, he was really, really extremely talented um, uh, designer uh, who was able to design in all sorts of scales and able to do a lot based, uh, made of very, very simple and cheap materials. So this is something we really admire a lot. Uh, for example, I don't know if you study his work in the churches or, or even his um, little pieces of furniture or dishes for the church and so on and so on he mainly managed to do with very cheap materials something extraordinary and this is something uh, really to be admired and we look at that often and try to hope that we can achieve similar <laughs> and then what we also admire about him is that he was so special and different um, he his work was done um, in the time of modernism in the time of le corbusier and kind of this kind of discussion of functionalism and so on when the uh, the buildings in you know, Bauhaus and so on when the buildings in a way especially in Europe and also later in the states were all 
towards a similar idea in a way getting generic because they all kind of uh, studied uh, this the same idea so he was working at that time but doing something completely different um, uh, taking inspiration from antique, from local Slovenian heritage, from his own, uh, you know, imagination, and so on and so on. And this is what we admire uh, in him the most, that he, you know, maintained this uh, special identity and character in, in that uh, time. And this is something that we would like to say at the end, uh, of our you know career that maybe this was also something what we achieved that in this uh, generic uh, time of instagram and pinterest and when everything in a way is so much the same uh, we did something different so you know that we keep our own identity this is for us very important and uh, this is for us the biggest me message from plichnik Spila, thank you. This was just the perfect conclusion. I mean, <laughs> thank you very much for, for this final message. <laughs> and uh, I hope also for our students it is a kind of inspiration how they should deal with their profession in, uh, in the future because they are actually in their last year, so uh, young architects already. So, I mean, we have exhausted <laughs> you quite a lot, <laughs> two hours. Thank you very much for, for being with us and uh, that you have accepted our invitation and thank you for your great lecture and I, I wish you all the best for your future work. It was a big pleasure to spend the evening with you. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you again for the invitation of the same for me and hopefully to see you in person at some point. Thank you okay. very much. Okay. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.